Yeah, well, thank you all for being here. This is, uh, I'll, I'll do a little, a little formal introduction because I know uh, just based on the 10 minutes before everybody logged on, it was like the Big Texas Read had started. And so I'm so excited uh, to hear y'all's conversation and uh, welcome you to the Big Texas Read. Uh, thank you everyone for being here on another Wednesday night. Um, my name is Blake Kimsey. I'm the executive director of Writing Workshops Dallas. And over two and a half years ago, um, David Samuel Levinson said, hey, let's get together during this pandemic and create a uh, book reading series where we listen to authors uh, talk about their work, the craft, business of writing, all that stuff. And uh, he said, we can't do this without Gemini Inc. down in San Antonio. And uh, that's how I've gotten to know Alexandra Vandekamp, who's the executive director down there. And uh, it's just been an, a great two and a half years uh, that we've been doing the Big Texas Read. And um, this would not be possible without um, a great uh, sponsorship from Humanities Texas, who's given us a grant so that we can have honorarium for this event. Um, we love Lone Star Literary. They always help us spread the word. They were spreading the word this week about the Big Texas Read. So if you're inside of Texas, be sure to check out the Big Tech, uh, I'm sorry, Lone Star Literary, uh, because they're going to um, tell you what's going on in the state, um, all things literary. Um, and also the University of Texas San Antonio Library System always helps us spread the word, which is great. And so we are just so happy that you're here. So I'm going to turn it over to Alexandra Vandekamp, Executive Director down at Gemini Inc. Alexandra, so good to see you again. Yeah, no, I'm going to keep it short because we want to hear the amazing authors we have tonight. Um, so we are San Antonio's Writing Arts Center, everyone. Um, our mission is to teach the craft of writing to people of all skill levels so they can bring their stories to life. Um, and we love bringing readers together with writers. So the Big Texas Read, it began as a pandemic thing, but now we just love Zooming authors into your home. <laughs> so um, I think we have a great, um, two great, um, Jessica Piazza is our moderator and obviously Jill is our amazing author. Um, I just can't wait to see how they talk and how they share about their writing journey in this great novel. Leave your comments in the chat. We um, love having an active, lively chat. Shout out your love about everything you hear. And then we will have an audience Q&A at the end. So feel free to post questions for Jill to respond to for the last portion of this. That's it, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. And now I will introduce our amazingly beautiful moderator. Jessica Piazza, just kidding, Piazza. Jessica Piazza is the author of three poetry collections in Tarabang, which is amazing. Everyone must read it. This is Not a Sky and Obliterations with Heather Amy O'Neill, as well as the children's book, Olivia Otter Builds Her Rap, which I now will buy for all of my nephews and nieces. Born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, Jessica now lives in Los Angeles, where she teaches at the University of Southern California. She co-founded Bat City Review in Austin, Texas, and Goldline Press, Los Angeles, California, and curates Poetry Has Value, which focuses on the intersections of poetry, money, and worth. She is the recipient of the Amy Clampett Residency and is working on a new poetry collection and a novel. Her poems have most recently appeared in Best American Poetry, Smartest Pace, and 32 Poems. Very accomplished. Now our very accomplished featured writer, Miss. Mrs. Miss, Miss Jill Alexander Esbaum is an American poet, writer, and professor. Her most recent collections are the full-length manuscripts Harlot and Necropolis. Esbaum's poetry features puns, wordplay, and dark humor, often mixed with religious and erotic imagery. Um, I would be here like until tomorrow to read like all the amazing reviews of Jill's novel, um, but I think probably everyone knows how amazing it is because you've read it. So I will not go through all of them, but holy fuck. So welcome both of you. I am excited to bring you both here. I love Jessica and I love Jill. Take it away. Well, hi, I'm really happy to be talking to Jill. She is literally my favorite writer. And I say this with no nepotism or cronyism in the house whatsoever. And in fact, I think part of the reason why initially we became best friends is because I just was like, how can I, how can I be you? How can I write like you? Do you um, remember the day we met? Yeah, we went, oh God, are we going to go there? <laughs> yeah, we went to lunch. We did, with? we went to lunch. Craig. With Craig. Wow. Um, you can, yeah, 
<laughs> um, Craig Arnold was a incredibly amazing poet um, who died, uh, God, many years ago now. How long? Like 2010 Ten. or nine. Yeah, so, yeah, 12 years ago, but he was a force force, force, force to be reckoned with. And he is uh, the person who is responsible for this unholy union of me and you. So uh, wherever you are, Craig. Um, but yeah, I, I, I know that you were considering starting off by reading a little something. So I wanted to Should I? say we're, yeah, just, I mean, in a paragraph or two, your language is everything. So I think everybody would be really happy to hear you, that language in your voice. Okay. Um, well, I was hoping, well, not hoping, I thought I would just pick a random paragraph in the middle of the book, but that's dumb. So I just am going to start at the beginning. Anna was a good wife, mostly. It was mid-afternoon and the train she rode first wrenched, then eased around a bend in the track before it pulled into Bunhof Dietlochon at 34 past the hour as ever. It's not just an adage, it's an absolute fact. Swiss trains run on time. The S Act originated in Pfeffercon, a small town 30 kilometers away. From Pfeffercon, its route sliced upward along the shores of the Zurich Sea through Horgen, Horgen, on the, on the lake, <laughs> <of Horgen. laughs> through Talwil, through Kilchberg, tiny towns in which tiny lives were led. From Fafakon, the train made 16 stops before it reached Dietlikon, the tiny town in which Anna's own tiny life was led. Thus, the ordinary fact of a train schedule modulated Anna's daily plans. Dietlikon's bus didn't run into the city. Taxi cabs were expensive and impractical. And while the Benz family owned a car, Anna didn't drive. She did not have a license. So her world was tightly circumscribed by the comings and goings of locomotives, by the willingness of Bruno, Anna's husband, or Ursula, Bruno's mother, to drive her places unreachable by bus, and by the engine of her own legs and what distance they could carry her, which was rarely as far as she'd have liked to go. But Swiss trains really do run on time, and Anna managed with minimal hassle. And she liked riding the trains. She found a lulling comfort in the way they rocked side to side as they moved forward. Edith Hammer, another expatriate, once told Anna that there was only one reason the Swiss trains ever ran late, when someone jumps in front of them. That's enough. <sighs> All right. I was skimming this book again. And I'm glad you read the beginning because I had forgotten or maybe just I didn't have enough distance and perspective to realize how much, first of all, how much foreshadowing is in that entire page. <laughs> Basically, most of what you have to know about Anna as a human. Like I just read the whole book, I think, just kind of like that's the whole book. That's right. Most of what you have to know about Anna as a human is in there. Most of her circumstances in there. Most of the ways she tries to cope are in there. And of course, the the gun that you introduce in the first act that has to go off in the last act, which is the trains running on time. So this is a sort of trite question, perhaps, but like, but my my readers in, in, my, in the book clubs that I facilitate always ask, did you mean to do that? <laughs> like, did they mean it or did it just happen? What do you but mean? now that I mean, oh yes, yeah, did okay. I put that in there on purpose? Um, yeah, because it would be. So, I don't like to write something that, like, that turns into like dun dun dun, you know, like a an aha moment, a a, a surprise, the no jump scares. Because if you get to the end of a book or a, a paragraph or a story or even a poem I guess and you already know the ending you're like wow that's really stupid why did I read this whole book so why not just lay it out from the beginning it's not about the surprise it's it's about the journey you know I really wonder actually if some of the readers were surprised by the ending I think later that's something maybe for the Q&A or for the chat but um because you did 
leave certainly leave clues and because it felt like an inevitable build but i know for you because i was there as an author for you that was an inevitable build right it wasn't ever a decision about what was going to happen and i think that that's really interesting when what is going to happen is something tragic right there's no there's no happy ending coming there's no real redemption for Anna, at least. Well, okay. I mean, maybe, maybe after, <laughs> but you, no, you but and I believe but differently. I, but I don't know if you remember, but I, when I was writing it, I hadn't, I was pretty sure I knew how it was going to end, but I wrote the whole book start to finish. And I wrote the last chapter uh, between a uh, Good Friday service and Easter vigil in, uh, what year was that? Uh, 11, because like, I wanted to allow, I don't know. I like I like symbolism and symmetry and all that crap, but I wanted to allow the possibility for something to shift. And it did end as I thought it would, but doing that though brought in and we were talking about this brought in another character, sort of some more subtext and that was interesting. I I always recommend and my students hate it, but like write the last chapter last, like really write it last. This is indicative of you. I wonder if if people here are interested in knowing this but like you have lots of ways to trick yourself into writing into writing differently than you might immediately write or trick yourself outside of your first thoughts on things or what you might classically do i, I wonder i think that people might be interested in that because i'm fascinated i think you are one of the most fascinating people in the world anyway um no just as a human you are a quirky person in all the best ways but yeah so do you felt if you felt like that was almost opening a stage for you to maybe improvise a little bit writing in that period and is that do you feel like that is indicative of who you are as a writer a little bit so for me it's all about the words like sounds make words and words make sentences and thoughts and plot and all that other stuff is secondary to the actual act of putting two sounds together especially in poetry and I always want, it, of course, you begin with some kind of scaffold, but you're going to take the scaffold away at some point, and you want your structure to stand. And to me, that's where the language and syntax and uh, subtext and, and how it, you know, I want my shit to roll off people's tongues. And when it doesn't, I want that to be there for a reason. You know, if there's yeah. a hard stop at the end of the line. So uh, I, I do trick myself a lot you know, uh, I time, I do timed readings. I, I write standing up. Sometimes I, uh, uh, do timed writings. I, I do that kind of a Ulipo thing where it's like, okay, write some sentences without the letter, you know, Z that one's easy, but, uh, or, <laughs> or uh, do, I, well, I don't know if you noticed, but in what I read, it slips into iambic very, Kind of almost immediately it kind of comes in and out of it but whenever i get stuck i force myself to write niambic because that's that's the heartbeat and when you have to when you have to force yourself that way it's like wearing a corset or like spanx under a knit dress you you can wear more things like i don't care how skinny <laughs> you look, nobody looks good in a knit dress without spanx and so like that shit just like cinches it up I remember when you realized that when you when you had this like sort of aha moment that so many of the lines that you loved from literature were actually in iambic if you broke them down and you called me in this like haze of excitement about it and we started talking about it actually it was because of you that I wrote a series of short stories in iambic that I had to totally sort of de prosodize after a while right still, and that's when you then you go in and you fuck it up a little bit because mm -hmm. you know that's the the that's the signature. Well, because in your writing, I mean, and I'm thematically really, and, and this is sort of indicative of what you said for a second, I want everything to be smooth. And if it's not, I want it to be on purpose. But there's something about the fucking it up. That's kind of quintessential thematically to your writing. <laughs> I mean, to your poetry and also to, um, to this novel to Housefrau. I mean, Housefrau is about a sort of from an author's point of view, from a reader's point of view, unapologetically fucked up person. Like you're not apologizing, oh, I'm sorry, my protagonist is so messy, you know? Um, and I, I wanna bring up because of that, the conversation we had yesterday when we were talking about um, 
the kinds of, of female protagonists that are accepted, loved, that people are really excited to read and how that changes, first of all, from country to country, because your book was published in 27 countries, which is an insane, insane accomplishment. But also just that for some reason, and, and I think, I don't know, it must have been you, I, one of us said something about the female zeitgeist, right? That in the female zeitgeist right now, rage is great becoming, word that's smart yes, any conversation i, I know i know, I know what it means, female but... zeitgeist like that's not part of the female zeitgeist y'all like but, um, <laughs> but but in 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 the sort of sense of the allowable woman in media rage is having a moment angry women are having a moment but still sad women with no redemption not having as big of a moment or, or at least not like rage. So I, I wanted to talk about, I wanted you to talk about, um, I wanted to encourage you to talk about <laughs> writing a sad, fucked up woman who even though you gave, you know, fucked up in a way, everybody's fucked up, but fucked up in a sort of irredeemable way considering the end, the ending of this. Um, how, how did that, how did you feel about that? How did you conceive of writing that? What you considering what you know both of the industry and also the process of writing that? You know, there's that famous line from Flaubert, Madame Bovary, c'est moi. I am Madame Bovary. Anna Benz, see a stiff. Like she's me, you know, but she's not me but she is, but she's not, you know, we always write about ourselves to some extent, just like we always dream about ourselves. And, you know, everybody likes to talk about themselves, except when we don't. And when we don't, that's the moment that you want to interrogate. Look, sad ladies, <laughs> when uh, David Ebersoff bought the book, uh, he, <laughs> I, I was telling Jess this, he asked me, so how would you classify this and I said, oh, women's fiction. And he's like, mm, women's fiction is uplifting. And I said, <laughs> she looks up a little bit at the end. And he said, it's a very no, no, chill no. joke to make, by the way. <laughs> and But then I said, I, it's a book a sad lady would read. And it might not make her feel better, but it might make her feel less alone. I was a sad lady. I was a sad lady for a long fucking time. And coincidentally, it coincided with the time I was in Switzerland. You know, you remember. I do, I do. Well, that actually is a really important point because there, there are, well, let's talk about that letter you got, what you call your favorite letter you ever got about your book. Because I think that that speaks a little bit to who you were talking to in this book. I mean, you're talking to all of us. I think that if all of us are willing to sit with sadness and sit with discomfort, then there's something in this book for every single person who reads it, but not everybody's willing to do that. And again, particularly American audiences have a hard time with that. Whereas like, you know, the, a lot of the other countries you were published in, they were like, oh, the ennui, the drama, you know, but- um, And huge in Macedonia. I bet, <laughs> I bet. But yeah, I mean, for those who are willing to sit with discomfort, there's something here for everyone, but there are certain people who this book speaks to in very different ways. And so maybe you want to share that with us. So back to the rage having its its moment. I mean, you know, we wrote poems about Lizzie Borden, right? You know, it's uh, uh, the burning bed. There is there is there is a place for that, and we like to cheer for those women because why? Because they have been downtrodden, and they have sort of maybe not Lizzie Borden, but they have. Her stepmom was kind of a. See you next Tuesday, apparently, but never mind. Uh, it's it's a, like in the literary yes, canon. It, author says Lizzie Borden is okay. <laughs> News, <laughs> extra, extra. <laughs> um, Sorry. The, uh, the um, no, I forgot. We like Supergirl, right? We want to, we want to. They're they getting redemption when they're things. angry. You know, my favorite Bible story is when Jael puts the tent peg through Scissor's head after feeding him butter in lordly dishes. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, she did. I love that. But it's my favorite too. <laughs> Says the Jew. <laughs> it's Old Testament, so you know. Mm -hmm. um, no, I know. But, um, so 
the woman who wrote me a letter after it, it came out. So the thing is very true about the trains. I, I can't tell you how often that trains run late in Switzerland because somebody freaking jumps in front of one and you'll often see flowers, you know, like, like roadside memorials. So people would leave flowers. And this woman wrote me a story, a note that she was having a really hard time. And she had been uh, going to a therapist and it wasn't really working. And she was an American, she was an expat. She lived in the town that I lived, the town that this book is set in. There's a bench that features prominently. She knows that bench. She knew the landmarks. And somebody told her to read the book because she had been walking one day and you know, you walk by the trains and she saw some flowers. And like, you know, I remember when, <laughs> remember when like uh, Sylvia Plath killed herself and Anne Sexton got like all mad. She's like, she stole my suicide, uh, which is not really a thing to get mad about. But you know, you have that moment, you're like, someone's been here before me, which doesn't always make you feel better. But she wrote me and she told me that she found my book and it was the only thing that made her feel better. And then she sent me a picture of my book on the bench and then I cried and then, then we got to meet when I was in Switzerland and it was, then we cried together. And if, if that's the only thing that happened with this book, that's enough. But how do I say this? That also happened to me, you know? Like this book saved me, which sounds yeah. really crazy, but it did. I feel like that's true for a, for a lot of writers who who write yeah, in, in that so sort true. of passionate way. Yeah. And and I mean it does speak to this you know audiences want to know what's you what isn't kind of moment. I mean because I think that that is a thing whether we like it or not. But also maybe there's an inkling of truth to this idea that we come through and some well you're young yin in your way. So we come through in all the ways, right? Um but how how did you navigate that? I mean, there are certain parts of you that Anna is inspired by, and there are certain parts of you that are very, very different. Um, certain parts of your former marriage that this <laughs> is inspired by, and, and some that are not the key. Did you worry about this? Did you make decisions based on what you felt like was allowable? for audiences to know in your life or no, were you just not. like the story is everything? Well, it's fiction. I mean, that's, that's always a go-to. It's fiction. Oh, it didn't happen. I mean, you know, you, you can write, you write from the, the settings that you know and the places you know and, and some version of events that it, even if you conceive it in your own head, you know it, right? If it even if, it, if something happens to you in your head, it still happens to you. If something happens on the page, it still happens to you. So that's my go. It's fiction, you know. <laughs> Except for remember that journalist asking you that horrible question. Oh, yeah, yeah. A British journalist asked me how many affairs I had, and I just I. I wasn't going to answer that Ugh. question. I didn't answer that question. Whether I had had none or a thousand, it's not. Yeah, how dare? <laughs> like, how dare somebody ask that? It's, it's oh, the Brits. It's, it's a weird. It's a weird question, right? You know. I think it's a weird question, but I think that it's. But it, it speaks to the way that we think about fiction, especially when there is fiction that is rooted to some extent in the biography. Of where there are biography points that you can match up. Sure. Right? And and there is like, it's kind of, she's hypersexed a little. Mm -hmm. And I mean, um, you've been there, Jill. <laughs> Me too. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, the, I think sometimes writing any kind of intimacy. Uh, an intimacy of a feeling, an intimacy of, you know, body, whatever bodies do when they bump into each other. I mean, it, it does open a door and people want to know what's going on there. Often I tell my students, <laughs> my favorite kind of fiction, but really my favorite kind of writing is I want to, I want it to be like I'm peeping through a keyhole, looking at something I'm not really supposed to. Right. 
that's also kind of an Anna answer in a way. <laughs> so I mean, it's I don't remember you telling me. I remember one of my favorite things that happens in this book. Uh, well, no, so many, so many of my favorite things. But one of the one of my favorite little moments in this book is where Anna talks about not being able, like, not wanting to fall in love with someone with a name like Stephen, like with a name that has like a plain name, and that came straight out of your mouth. That's a that is a Jill thought, <laughs> which of course you ended up with an Alvin. So Bob, it worked out. yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like so. I think there is there's something in the voice that is always going to speak to you. And, and that also brings me to the fact that much of this does read like poetry. And I think that our audiences are going to agree with that. But not only does it read like poetry, there are also moments that are so invested in language. And in, in the, the psychotherapy sessions, often Anna is able to avoid what she really needs to be talking about or imply what she needs to be talking about but not really deal with it by going through these kind of sort of iterations and explorations of language how did that come to you why 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 is that what is that why the language stuff i love languages i i my my true love in this world is is words i don't care for writing per se except that's how you play with words um i love jokes. I love puns. I love languages. Uh, my major in college was French. When I moved to Switzerland, I took German. Alvin's mom has taught me to speak Taiwanese. You know, it's, there's lots of, of ways to, to speak and, you know, not just bodies bumping against each other. I love what happens when yeah. words bump against each other. Do you feel like language worked in this book as a way to reveal Anna or to obscure her? I Is that a weird question? It is weird, <laughs> but I think reveal partly because it takes place in a foreign country. And if you if you live somewhere and you you don't even know the word for toothpick, you know. Although that was like the first, that was the first sentence I said in German in Switzerland uh, to, I, like I said it to somebody at a restaurant and they brought me a toothpick. So I'm like, okay, useful, check, uh, but kind of random. But if you don't know the words, how can you, how can you live? If you, if you, you lose uh, avenues of communication. And how much does that speak to the point of, of Anna's, story she doesn't have the words even in english <laughs> she right? doesn't have the words she's very insecure which is like, yeah um which is hilarious because of of being this character that's so invested in words but i i mean i think so much of that has to do with everything and yeah everything in anna being so internal and why did why did you or what uh what did you think giving her the friendships that she and like Mary, I mean, what was the, we talked the other day about whether Anna's story was completely inevitable. And there at the end where she was trying to get in touch with everyone and there were points throughout where she could have, she could have revealed herself and she didn't. Why was that important for you? What, what, why was that important for you to make sure the readers knew? Because it's terrifying to reveal yourself. And when you, get the chance sometimes it's too late you know it's 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 waiting to call someone uh, that you're in love with until the night before their wedding you know <laughs> don't do that you know right. it's um and and you can't piss away opportunities if you want the opportunities to stay there i think but the bigger issue was how do you if you are so afraid to live, how do you get past that? Because ultimately, I mean, that's kind of one of the things is, is she can't get past herself. She can't and, get past herself. And I think that's so, yeah, go. I, well, I don't think that's unusual. No, I don't think so either. But I, what I do think is interesting is how readers I tend to respond to that in characters who are mothers. And her 
motherhood in this throws an interesting, interesting monkey wrench into her internal story. Um, how do you feel like the, where did the kids come into this trajectory and into her, the, the things that are unlikable about her, perhaps maybe even the things that are likable about her too. But that's because that's always one of the questions I want to ask you. Like, I think, am I frozen? You're a little frozen, yeah. Oh no, sorry it's about okay. that. I don't know what's happening. You're asking about the the her motherhood and her, rephrase rephrase the question. Sorry. Um. Yes, I'm I'm talking about her motherhood, and and one of the things that occurs to me is that a lot of the readers that I contact, not about this book, but that I interact with in general, have a problem liking mothers who don't do their very specific perfect duty that don't do perfectly by their children. That seems to be a point of, I, I mean, on top of unlikable women, characters, whatever that means, that tends to be a really uh, big pain point for readers. And so part of, part of this question is, how did you writing her relationship with her children affect your development of her as a character? And then another question, I think that's kind of a piggyback onto that is, though there are people who because of things like that will think Anna is unlikable what makes her likable to you like what do you think is likable about she's Anna? Not, because there are not, things she's not you don't think there's anything likable. I wouldn't want to hang would you want to hang out with her would you want to be one of her lovers would you want to eat dinner with her or or you know do a Christmas white elephant gift exchange no she's I mean like some of those maybe but She's not likable. She needs, but we don't always need to be liked. We need to be loved. That's good. I like that. Um, and so then, where do you her. think? I do love her. You know, and we'll get to the first part of the question. But we were talking about this the other day. I have this. Uh, I, I like to articulate the fact that as readers of novels, we tend to either relate to the characters and protagonists and put ourselves into their story or often if we they are unrelatable to us in some way then I, I find that what readers do is they ask themselves what they would do if they encountered or were in the lives of these kinds of people and I think Anne is a really interesting character for that reason because for me, like, I, I think there are, you know, someone in the chat just said in some ways she's relatable for most women. And I think that's really true. But if there are parts of her story that you can't um, hook into for yourself, for me, one of the things I kept thinking about every time I read it was, what, what do I do if a person like this is in my life, right? <laughs> who is struggling in this way, who is reticent in this way, who is clearly sad. And so it, it is, it, loving is really the key right loving a character like that is loving a person like that can be difficult and in some ways this book is so generous uh toward Anna because I think that it's clear that you loved her it's clear that almost I feel like there's almost this authorial voice that wanted her to be okay but that wasn't and maybe I'm just reading into it I'm not sure um well I mean, the people, like, I want to ask you, like, how did you love me through that time? <laughs> like, I was not a great, not the best of people to be around. I was not. That's a good, same. it's not yeah. a good question. I have an answer, but that's a good question in terms of the book. I loved you through that time because I loved you for who you are at your core as a human, which you were able to share with me, right? And I wonder why you've decided there were some flashbacks of life before but it is not a, a, a wildly significant part of the story unless you think it's uh, and I, I why did you not why was it not a concern to give us reasons to really love her before this time I don't even think we talked about that when you were writing it that much no I'm not sure it was a conscious choice, but I think in terms of, of in terms of in retrospective narratively, the reason that I would say in past tense I did it is because that's the story is about the moment. It's not the story takes place exactly over three months 
exactly in a fall uh, begins. Uh, there's a there's markers through it. There's like birthdays in each uh, section, and uh, the uh, that was it was kind of written like a poem a little bit. It was kind of like I, I thought about a sonnet a lot when I was when I was writing it. But the, there's a turn for sure. <laughs> But it's 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 not it, her backstory is almost irrelevant. It's her her you know her front story because it 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 doesn't go on. <laughs> you said front well, yeah, story. a lot of it is about her front story. <laughs> she does with um, the front story. Uh, her front story. I cannot. Yeah, I mean, I just thought it was interesting because again, this is a woman who ends up where she ends up. We know the bones, right? We know why, but. Um, but there's something super refreshing to me about the fact that it just marches through this moment. Now, with the occasional flashback, but almost those flashbacks almost exist within this world too, especially because this is kind of like very, very popular kind of post postmodern need to go to multiple timelines and to really develop multiple timelines in novels. And I thought that there was something incredibly refreshing about the fact that you did it. And also something very Madame Bovary-like, which you know that I hate and you love, but I love your book. <laughs> and I, we have Jill and I just for the 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 rest of you. We have an existential battle about Madame Bovary as a novel, and I I, I deeply dislike it. Um, but I deeply dislike it because I find it boring and overlong. And you are a sharp, sharp writer of sentences. There is no way you are going to get boring or overlong in your books. Um, but yeah, it, it, there is the, there is this moment, and I th I do think it's interesting too because I think that there's a good question of, oh yeah, no, Anna Karenina. Sorry, somebody in the chat just came up with just. Uh, oh, sorry, Alexandra brought up uh, Anna Karenina, and that was there. I mean, that was there from the beginning too. But I think that um, it's Madame Bo Madame Bovary was the real inspiration. I think. Yeah, yeah, I think that people tend to say Anna Karenina more than Madame Bovary for this book because Anna of the. Train. Yeah, it's because of the chains, those trains. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, there's so there's so much to just just to shift right before we leave because I think that um, I really want your readers to to know this. Your process of writing is so interesting, and your process of editing is so interesting that I we were talking before people jumped on about language and how language is so important to what you do, so much so that you. Well, you have an interesting take. I, I was joking that I heard the proto audiobook of of House Frau, and David actually highly suggests everybody listen to the um, the actual audiobook. But you can tell people what I mean by the proto audiobook because I think that's so interesting. Um, so a lot of if you know me, you know this. Every time I write a draft of something, I record it. And I record it in my best time life operator voice, like, you know, uh, the, the the lady who makes the announcements over the, you know, in the airport that you can never hear. Something really pleasant. And like, I take the moment to kind of, even if it's a shitty draft, honor the, the process so that I can just listen to it over and over and over again and hear what's missing or hear what falls wrong or uh check the pace uh is is because I did want to write a book that that has a very continuous pace that that really does you're right it does go back but I think it moves forward uh, yeah. mostly. and so every time I wrote a draft I recorded it from scratch with that same you know and then at the end when I was before I even sent it to anybody I just played that start to finish on loop over and over for like weeks just and the walks you took Anna's walks <laughs> I took Anna's walks the walks in the book were the walks I actually took I, that those were my haunts those were my paths look I didn't have barely any friends in Switzerland I didn't speak the language very well and I was married to a man who didn't want to be married to me anymore and uh, I didn't have a driver's license I didn't all I did was walk and, and that's why I love later when you were listening to the drafts, you were walking again, but it was such a different kind of walk. It was like a creating something out right. of, and out back of in, that. Back in, back in, I was back in Austin at that point. Uh -huh. so, exactly. Uh, I had I love more that. of a solitary time. <laughs> exactly. Before we go into the q and I just want to wrap it up on one of my favorite things about the 
sort of backstory lore of this book, which is I, I want everybody to conjure up the, the scene of me and Jill trying to have sober, considered literary conversations about the sex scenes as you were writing them, which is my favorite part. You're like, so I compared there's, You know, talk. there's a line that just takes in here. Do you know which one I'm talking about? The it's line that you, you- I don't remember. Is it the cock? Is it the dinner plate cock? Because <laughs> I love oh, that, that one now. That was, that was one of them, but it was the one about the sliding out like a soapy brain. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. laugh every time I read it because it's gross. Right. I can't believe I forgot that was the line. Yeah, the, the soapy ring line. But like, it's hard to write good sex scenes. And I think these are good, not because they're so erotic, but in some ways because they're so honest to the character's actual experience in those moments, right? They're, they're, they're a little wild and, and kind of desperate and kind of sad. Like, how did you, how'd that happen? I mean, I That's know how that happened because I was there talking about dinner plate cocks, but like, why don't you share that with everyone? Um, desperate is the exact right word. That, that they're not meant to be sexy. They're not meant to be titillating. But they're dirty. They're meant, yeah, because, you know, it, especially cl uh, clandestine sex is, is taboo, is tainted, is, um, is, is that kind of, uh, it's rushed, it's hurried, it's, it, people are, are grossed out about the period sex in, in the book, but like, raise your hand if you've been there, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it happens. And so I wanted to write like something natural that reflects maybe parts of a woman's sexuality that not everybody thinks about all that, or we don't want to think about, like, why do I want to think about that? I love that because I think part of the question is, I mean, you didn't have to write so explicitly, but I think that there was something writing explicitly that added to both the tension and also the desperation. Uh, but also the joy of reading it, sorry, like those sex scenes really help us understand who like Anna is and like what this scenario is. This is not, I mean, this is the kind of, some of these situations are the kinds of sex that many of us have had and maybe don't want to talk about, but either way, you understand this woman so clearly because oh, of it. And they're, they're fun to read. She lives in her head. That's the only place. So she, she's, quite disembodied in a lot of ways. She's not grounded. And that's the way she kind of grounds herself. I mean, Mark Haskell Smith gave me, and if, if y'all don't know who he is, you should read him. He's amazing. He's wonderful. He gave me like this amazing advice. He's like, if you're just, if you're going to go a little bit, go a lot, you know, no, no purpling of the prose. You, you, you know, there's no throbbing wands of pleasure. It's yeah. Like that. It's just, it is. All right, I think we, we're we gonna go to the Q&A. We're gonna go to some of the, the chat questions. And of course, if anybody would like to ask a live question, uh, feel free to uh, indicate that to us. But let's start with uh, Melinda's question. Uh, Jill, you can read it, but I'll read it for everybody just in case. Yesterday on Twitter, someone posted a writer's comment that there's no such thing as writer's block. There is only writer's dread, which I know is gonna be an interesting question for you, Jilly. Uh, meaning what we call block is actually defense for when we come to a place in a piece and don't know what comes next or how to keep it moving or opening up. And so the question here is if you agree, and if so, what are the some ways you might address your writer's dread? I think it's always important to surprise yourself. Um, so in my fiction class for last residency, I made these little bracelets uh, for our group that said uh, DBB on it and DFQ. And that is like two things that, because if I had to do the whole sentence that I had to pay more, but uh, <laughs> DBB stands for two things. It's don't be boring, but also maybe more important, don't be bored. Like that's when you hit those walls. Are you bored with what you're doing? Shake it up, um, move something around, bring in a new character, uh, change the scene. Don't, don't be bored. When you're bored, you're boring. And you're never gonna, I mean like, <laughs> again, the TV is not that. gonna watch itself, so. Uh, <laughs> they need a reason to like not binge watch Sister Wives. 
oh my god that's all you've been doing i don't want to talk about oh, it I've been it's doing like you watch it way too much <laughs> it's, it's, it's much it's over much okay uh next question was our own david levinson uh every reader has uh their own opinion or take on a book we talked about this the other day actually have you encountered a reader or readers who've completely misread what's there on the page or the story you told through Anna. We were talking about this in terms of like, did people get lessons from it? That I mean, again, I believe that like once you read a book, it's yours and you get to do with it what you want and believe yep. about it what you want. But at the same time, it is interesting as a writer when you publish to get to understand like or hear the lessons or the, the ideas people get from it. Was there ever a disconnect there? Uh, so... I think about, um, like my dad taught me how to shoot when I was a kid, you know, Texas. And once the bullet leaves the chamber, you have no control over where it goes anymore. That's it, you're done. Your part is over. My part was to put it on paper. I, I, I don't know, I, I have a very low theology of author intent. Uh, I, I do think that once it leaves, I have my own experience and it's a very intimate experience uh, mm -hmm. because, you know, I don't have to look up where these places are, you know, Horgan, you know, Horgan. <laughs> things like that. But so once the book leaves your, your hands, you're done. It's, it's, you can tell people what it means to you, what you think about it, but it, if I listen to a piece of music, it's my experience. If you read a book, it's your experience. And, and I think that that's valid. Well, that's actually another, that really leads into another question in the chat right now, which is uh, by uh, Tyrina, I hope I pronounced your name right, but there's a saying, write like no one will read it. Do you think that's the way you wrote Housefrau? And if you did, do you think writing this way is the key to producing something successful, a successful story? No. You should write the book that only you can write. You should write the book that you want to read. So you are the one, even if you're the one person, so you're not no one. Hi, That's Tyree. lovely. But I also agree that as like, certainly as a teacher, I do not want my students writing as if no one <laughs> will read it. I'm like, I, I can't tell you how many times I've sit there in the class being like, someone has to read this, <laughs> okay? So well, and please, I don't mean that to sound write like, a, like you can. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, it's it's. I don't mean that as like a sound bite or anything. It's it's such a lonely thing what we do. It's doesn't it it pays off. It it doesn't pay off nearly as much as it like breaks your heart. Uh, you have to sit alone for a long time. Uh, your your friends want to go out and you're like, oh, I got to write a sentence. And, you know, you're still writing that sentence the next morning. And it's, it's thankless work until it's not. But it's not, you know what I'm saying? So you should want to write that way. Now, I, I sort of know the, the context. Of, you know, it's like dance like no one's watching. Write with abandon, you know. Edit with constraint. Right, like a motherfucker. <laughs> right, like a motherfucker. Like Cheryl might say. <laughs> Which is, never mind. What? Cheryl's face. So I just wrote her like a fucker. Right. No, that's true. She, she's there's a lot of fucking <laughs> with her. Um, I have, oh, are there, is there anybody who would like to ask a question either in the chat or live as of now? I would love to see people's faces. Um. Okay, David gets going, and then Alexander, let's go. What's DFQ, man? Oh, don't You're fucking me hanging. Don't fucking. Quit. Okay, I thought it was Dallas Fort Quatch or something. <laughs> that, that that's also what it is. <laughs> Quatch is my favorite German word now. Quatch. You know, you know Quatch. You know Quatch. No, what is it? Quatch. Nonsense. Nonsense. Oh, Quatch. Quatch. Yeah. Quatch. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I'm much pronounced. No, no, and, okay, and so don't fucking like, quit. I also Sorry. made little pen. I still have little pencils here that I made with that on it too, because pencils are cheap and bracelets. Yes, <laughs> it's always a money question. But DFQ, don't fucking quit. Like that, if you're going to go- Were there moments where you go. wanted to quit? Did you have moments where you were like, I can't deal with Anna anymore? Uh, pretty much every page, but, I knew I wasn't because that's 
Like, yeah, that no. never, that was never a realistic question. Was it like, you know, you want, it's like, you know, I, I want to eat the whole cake, but I don't, except when I do, because icing is the best thing. No, it's, uh, I, I knew I wasn't going to quit. It was, but I wanted to, I mean, like, of course you want to abandon things. You want, you want things to write themselves and they're not going to, why don't they? Oh God, I wish they did. Um, but I mean, we can get a Roomba like that, like that used to be like out of our thoughts, like uh, the self vacuum cleaner. There's lots of things that can do it themselves, but writing is not yeah, one of them. Writing isn't one of them. Um, I love the question here uh, about what reaction, uh, two questions sort of fit together. So um, what are some of the differences in how the book or the character was received in different countries, but then also uh, Stefan asked, what are some of the reactions you got from your Swiss readers? So that's, I think they're kind of similar questions and like, how did the Swiss like the book? And also how did the reactions differ? Um, so uh, Sweden loved it. Sweden was <laughs> super cool about it. They picked up on things that nobody else picked up on. And I was, I was telling you about that and I was, I was really. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just laughing, thinking about the the Swedes being like, "Yeah, the Swiss are so depressing." <laughs> of course, they make <laughs> her kill herself. We win. <laughs> like, um, I don't know. I think maybe half and half with Switzerland. Uh, the in some ways, it's a love letter to Switzerland, um, the the countryside, and you know, it it wasn't. Switzerland's fault that I wanted to die every day I lived there it wasn't their fault yeah uh, no I hear you it uh, and there were places and feelings and and sense that I didn't want to forget I mean and to be honest I started writing a book of poems that and in my last book Woodland there's there's a lot of uh, Switzerland uh, <laughs> <laughs> poems. <laughs> like, some of this like I wanted to remember so it wasn't gonna translate it into poetry you know right right and nobody wants to read a poem called Fefecon. it's just doesn't when, when I have to have like a million footnotes it's it just you know it, it took the shape of a of a novel I didn't think yeah. I, I mean I always wanted to be a not okay so I wanted to be a novelist Actually, I wanted to be a stand-up comic when I was a kid, and then I wanted to be a novelist, but like you have to sit down longer, uh, and it turns out I was like good with rhyming and meter and things like that that are like completely outre now, but you know, whatever, we do what we do. Are they? <laughs> How dare. But my dad always wanted me, he used to say in his thick Texas accent, uh, Jill baby, why don't you write me a dirty book so I can retire, <laughs> which is why the, <laughs> the book is weirdly dedicated to my father. <laughs> That is kind of a lot. Yeah. <laughs> but I love that. I mean, I know you, so I love that. But um, yeah, and I, I and when you lived in Switzerland, like you had so much good to say about the place itself. Um, it just, it turns out, I mean, and, and that, I think that reads in this at some point. It was like, Anna was not in a place to kind of accept the good things that were available there, you know? See, um <laughs> it's like I want to see who's in this room first to make sure uh no I'm not going to uh, uh -oh. I remember it wasn't the it wasn't the people it was a person in Switzerland I mean like in some ways this book is a reaction against my marriage and I did let him read it before it was published uh because I I, I wanted I it remember to be it. that was interesting our time um and uh I wanted it to um I, he needed to read it but it yeah. was good. I think, you know, in some ways, a symbolic act of, you know, putting the kind no, of No, course. And it felt necessary. I mean, and, and it, of course, I mean, we could have a whole side conversation about how much we owe the people who inspire some of our characters in some ways or another, but I feel like that could take forever. Um, and the answer is probably, oh, I don't know what the answer is actually. If well, I knew the answer, I guess we would have- The answer is that. it's fiction. It's, but fiction comes from right. your experience, so. Right, of course. Um, so there is uh, there are a few more questions. Uh, we talked about the woman's guide in the literary world being rage in modern day. Do you think vulnerability is empowering or overrated for a female heroine? I think it's an interesting question too, because it kind of fits into like how do we react to sad to just 
terminally chronically sad women in fiction. So I, I, if she's still on here, there's somebody in here who I think like two emails ago, I, she asked how I was doing uh, and I wrote back, well, not great. And apparently, according to Brene Brown, I'm supposed to be vulnerable. So not great, <laughs> you know, um, authenticity comes from vulnerability. Uh, and if, if you're not vulnerable around me, I can't take care of you. And we have to be careful who we're vulnerable around. But sure. of course, but for our protagonist. Well, I, 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 they think, I think that that is necessary for them too. I mean, unless they are specifically a kind of character who's never going to be, you know, it's like anti, you know, that's the opposite point. If I'm writing an opposite kind of book, I mean, but that's a whole other, uh, Anna is vulnerable, which is why she puts up like all of those freaking, this is the benefit of a close third, uh, narrator yep. because you know you they can do one thing but feel another that's the interesting thing Anna is vulnerable like uh a like a deer in the woods is vulnerable but she's not vulnerable like an open wound vulnerable like she is not uh open <laughs> right she's it, she's not open almost at all um and you know that's why the the twists and turns in this book although again I think you're right that the book doesn't um it's not invested in the aha moment. Like when we find out that Polly Jean, you know, is not, is not Bruno's kid. I don't think anybody's like, whoa, <laughs> what a that revelation. Just, you just need to like, I, I'm of the opinion that you just have to cop to that. Otherwise, you know, it, it's sloppy. But it's a different kind of book, right? Than, than a book who's like, it, it's not, it doesn't, there is an element of what's going to happen. And again, you said you even wrote it with the possibility of things going differently. But in some ways, in some uh, crucial ways that I think speak to the beauty and amazingness of your writing, it feels like an inevitable march toward what happened. But so so the the excitement in the book, the I, I, it's hard to say joy about such a sad book, but really the, the joy as a reader in it is how does this happen? Like, how do you get there? And that last page, I just want to point out the, the just virtuosity of those last pages where she's sitting and thinking about all the people and all the situations. And, and it just, for the reader, I have goosebumps. I have literal goosebumps talking about this. I want to show you because you're just like, God, this can happen. Like as much as you want to help people and be in their lives and as, well, as much as you want to make sure that you're okay and that you have a support system like there can be a day where all of the cracks <laughs> are there and and it just slips through so there is something that makes it a very particular kind of book not a what's going to happen book but like a how can this happen book does that feel right yeah i mean i just <laughs> I don't mean to speak in metaphors, but a train goes one direction on its track. You know, it doesn't turn right or left. It can't, you know, you know, turn back. I mean, I suppose shunting yards and shit like that, but it goes, <laughs> it, it stops where it's supposed to go or it derails or, you know, um, so knowing the trajectory, I think was, you know, it, things can happen before it gets there, but the trajectory was absolutely clear to me you know something that didn't get brought up uh, but I think falls into it yes it can things can happen to people things can happen to us that we don't even our husbands could beat the shit out of us you know we could make a mistake a year ago and you know give birth to that mistake you know we could uh uh make a turn this way and run into trouble or make a turn that way and have something wonderful happen to us absolutely and, right? and, and it, 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 yeah. it really shows in the end of the book like the way that you chose to un unravel that that moment and Alexandra I know you have a question too if you want to ask it live as opposed to in the chat you're welcome to <laughs> Sure, I, I actually like was really enjoying all this conversation. So, I mean, I'm a poet. And so I just am always fascinated when poets shift different forms. So 
I just wanted to know how it felt. It might've felt euphoric and amazing. I have no idea to shift from writing like collections of poems to a novel. Was there it's a hard. specific <laughs> challenge or delight in that, Jill? <laughs> um, okay. Novelists, close your ears. Poets, open your ears. Like people read novels, like write a novel. Like seriously, I, I, I want to be like the Moses of poets writing novels these days, you know? Let, let us let us go forth and take over the place because it's it's it, it's nice to be it really is nice to be read I mean people do read <laughs> you know exactly you know what I mean I do I totally do <laughs> so sad I mean we might it might be the noble art but it's uh, uh you know noble also, gets you. poets should write novels because I think poets make better novelists than novelists make poets so and that's controversial but I have some fiction writing friends who are like, I'm gonna take a crack at poetry, who like really are in like steeped in fiction writing. I'm like, all right, you you do that. <laughs> We're just see how that goes. That's the one thing that it that it's harder to well, you know, again, we're used to writing things that are skinny and on the left, and you know, having um, some it sometimes it was hard for me to always know until I did know um, how to breathe how to put more air into a moment how to like open up the bellows uh extend mm -hmm. it um slow something down how to speed it up and of course every time i sit down to write i have to teach myself how to do that again to, to varying degrees of success to totally write a novel like seriously just you don't even have to have like an idea just sit, it's have a character you know have a name have a title to the book i had a title to the book before i had anything else I just you know. knew that was going to be the title. But writing long things is so hard. <laughs> like, I feel like, I'm just like, uh, why? Like, so so I'm working on a manuscript right now. And uh, I, as a, I, I do timed sessions of writing. So I do several throughout a day. And uh, because rather, if I just sit there to try to get 2,000 words out, it's seriously shiny bird. You know, oh, time to tell you, you're the best trick <laughs> yourself into writing person I've ever met. Yeah. And I mean, you know, I'm so far ahead on Candy Crush. I mean, like I could really just do that. But I so right now my number is 13 minutes and 30, 13 seconds, because, again, symmetry and that feels about right. It's not 15 minutes because 15 minutes like it's a long time. Mm -hmm. 10 isn't long enough. So right now I always I set that. So I do that five times a day because my uh, uh uh, Lunar New Year uh, Zodiac a few years ago said five was a good number for me. So that's been in one of my, uh, when I do, yeah, I know it's weird, but, and so you. doing this, I get about 2000 words out in a day. They're, they're not great words, but whatever I'm, I'm, they're out. And uh, the pressure of time doesn't give me a chance to think too much Mm -hmm. I, I don't oh I'm doing this wrong oh I mean like mm -hmm. I'll revise that later you know of I'm course. good at revising that's the fun part you know this writing the long stuff is not the fun part but when you're pressed for time is like, like you know um you're trying to find something cute to wear because like they're going to pick you up and you don't know what to put and you've tried on 17 things but you just grab something and it turns out everybody loves that outfit like that's kind of my approach to it you know you just grab the stuff that's there and pretty soon the low-hanging fruit is gone so you got to pick the sweeter <laughs> stuff i'll say you said low-hanging fruit but <laughs> moving on <laughs> um no, I was going to, yeah, it's just get it on the page. You're so good at that. I was going to say bird by bird, but then you had the shiny bird thing. So we're not going to do that. Um, but yeah, like, keeping yourself from distraction, keeping oneself from distraction as a writer has to just be some of the most difficult. I mean, of course, again, we're going to, we're going to Cheryl straight it again, but it's like, just put your ass in the seat, and, you know, just, just write, you know, you have to just do the thing. And um, I wrote which, a playlist. I, I, I don't know if y'all do that, but I, I, it, it, I listened to the same like 15 songs for three years. Well, didn't, wasn't there, who was it that got the PJ Harvey embedded, uh, so, embedded Easter eggs in the yeah. book? There's some PJ Harvey Easter eggs in there. Not leastly, that's the name of the daughter is Polly Jean. Polly Jean, yeah. When they, they made this little film about the book, I was on this, uh, they, okay, Sweden is awesome. They have like, TV shows devoted to books that everybody watches. 
And I was Why only- are we not in Sweden? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so it was, there was another American writer there and I can't remember her name, me and uh, the novelist Peter Hug, uh, uh, Smell a Sense of Snow, uh, Borderliners. And mm-hmm. he's Danish, they're Swedish, they all speak English, and they're like just throwing all sorts of languages around. But they made a little video about the book, a little cartoon, and they sent it to PJ Harvey Music. And I'm like, I oh can't goodness. believe you figured that out. Like you get me, you so get me. Um, so do we tell people how you followed Nick Cave around all of yeah. Europe? For- <laughs> Um, yeah, you, you know what you like. Um, okay, so we just have another minute or two. I like to end, I'm gonna, you did not know I was gonna ask you this, but I like to end when I do conversations with authors, asking them what their favorite part of the book is. So that's what I'm gonna ask you. And I did not give you a chance to know that I was gonna ask you this. So it's gonna have to be like that dress that you pick out real quick and everybody thinks. Okay, so, and I wish I had it marked, but that line about the soapy finger slip in for the finger. No. Yeah. <laughs> okay, honestly, this is gonna sound awful, but uh, the scene where Bruno goes to town on her and not the good way go to town, like yeah, goes to town so, on her. Yeah. Um, that- Domestically abuses her, yes. <laughs> But yeah, yeah, Domestically, you, yes. because I, and I wanted to, well, as I was writing it, it became clear to me that she felt like she deserved it in a way that like, wasn't very new. Like, I, I hope it was nuanced, like, like not victimized deserves it, but like, it's the thing that's going to make her feel better because like, I have wronged you and this will make me feel better. It's it's yeah. it's a little bit of like a self-harm thing and it was it was difficult but I also wanted to show Bruno being just being fed up and then being tender and then I remember we th- there was a really interesting question when we were writing it about like how bad to make Bruno right like is he too villainous is he too nice like is it, like where is the line or you know how do you show both in a way that feels realistic yeah. Bruno Bruno gets you know what he can be mean and but um, I gave him a big dick and also he's hot so like you know he's got enough stuff going for him he can have some bad stuff <laughs> Dinner plate, right? I mean I'm not <laughs> sure those are the ones I would choose to be the good or bad thing no, I know, you know, I know. I sometimes it would be you know me <laughs> he's a good father and uh he he has he's he, he hopes you know and he's been actually kind of a decent husband until he's not Mostly. It's like we're, we're, yeah, mostly. It's like we're we're great people until we're not, and it, it doesn't have to be to like the degree that these characters do. But there are moments every day where I catch myself being the kind of person I wish I wasn't, you know. And yeah. luckily, we can do that in fiction. Well, I'm so glad we got to talk about this. Unless there's any other questions, I guess we're it's time to wrap it up. I'm getting cued. But I just love talking to you, Jilly. And I love everybody getting to know. I miss you too, but I just love people getting to know you better and to know what a wonderful, interesting, fantastic, amazing person you are. So that makes my heart happy. And thank you all. You know, thank you, David. Thank you, Texas Degree. Thank you, Gemini. Thank Thank you, thank you, thank you. This was super fun. Yeah, awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. We loved having you. Don't go away. Everyone else. Thank you for coming. Go away. Thank you so much for coming. You guys can go away. Interesting to y'all. And uh, yeah, we love it when you buy our books. Buy everybody's books here. Buy Jessica's books. Buy the books. Buy David's books. Buy all the books. (laughs) Buy all the books. Alexandra. Yeah. Well, tell us about your book. Um, I just published a book called Ricochet Script. (laughs) Um, it's my third book of poems, and I um. Yeah, it's about the body, everybody. I think that's one theme. You know how when you write a book of poems and you don't know what you're writing about and you're like, oh, that's what it was about. <laughs> so See, that doesn't happen to me and Jill because we're the, themes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The weirdness of the body and having a body and being in a body and um, and then other things as well. But thank you so much for asking. It's from, um, yeah, and there's some film poems. I love writing not about film, having it kind of seep in weird ways into the background of my poems. But, you know, thanks for asking. Yeah.
Awesome. Uh, this was a great, <laughs> yeah, this was a great author talk. I, I There's so many gems, everyone, in the chat and everything. I was trying to just capture a few. Um, it's Jill, like you said they just get better well, and better. And yeah. Yeah. So well, what, this is always the character question, of Big question, But when do you, this is a horrible question maybe to ask, but like, what are you working on now? Is there any sense of when a next wonderful like okay. piece of writing will be published? Here's what I can tell. Well, yes, I have this little kind of craft book, book of poetry. Okay. Maybe, I don't know, Jessica, I sent it to you. I don't know if you've looked at it yet. That's coming out. I've looked at some of them. They're cool. Sometime oh, cool. next year, but I got to write an essay. Uh, the novel I'm working on now, it's about this woman who does some stuff that she's not really proud of. And then some stuff happens. That's so, true. Like, <laughs> when you find your wheelhouse, you live there. You <laughs> stick to it. I think, yeah. uh, you know. It's a, it's a unique that's story. <laughs> it's, it's, What's that? It's a um, unique. Sorry, I don't mean, who's publishing the, the book that's your um, craft book, Jill? Uh, uh, Cooper Dillon Books. They also oh. did my last book of poetry, Woodland. And uh, Woodland is also incredible for those of you who love, I mean, actually Jill's first book, Harlot, is incredible. All of Jill's books are incredible. Woodland is, is just amazing. Buy it, buy it. Buy Harlot, buy Woodland, buy them all. If you like poems, <laughs> or if you don't, you might like poems after you buy Jill's books. So we awesome. love poetry here. At the big Sometimes Texas I love poetry. 